So in this video, we're going to continue in chapter three, and we're going to actually solve for our equilibrium in our simple model of the goods market. So recall from the earlier video, we have demand is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending. We've made some assumptions about what consumption depends on, right? It just depends on disposable income. We fixed investment, we fixed government spending. And then our equilibrium condition is simply that uh, production equals uh, demand. So we've got this equation, right? We, all we did to get from our last equation to this equation was replace Z with Y, right? That's our equilibrium condition. So now we have Y equals C0 plus C1 times Y minus T, that's disposable income, plus investment spending, which is fixed in this version, plus government spending. So now we've got a Y on both sides of our equation, right? And we're gonna use this equation then to solve for our equilibrium output and which by itself isn't not that interesting, but it's going to allow us, uh, more importantly, to see what happens uh, when there's a, a change, an exogenous shock to our system and see what happens. So this textbook, and I think it is a good thing, uh, emphasizes that we as economists need to be able to do uh, sort of three things, right? We need, when we, need, when we make our model of uh, whatever economic factor we're looking at, we need to use algebra to make sure that the logic is correct, right? And that involves some modeling assumptions. Um, those modeling assumptions are going to be very important. Whenever you see an economic model that doesn't seem to make any sense, um, it's not usually that they did their math wrong. It's usually that uh, they have some assumption there that is probably not quite correct. Um, we're going to use graphs to build the intuition, right? Graphs are a good way to uh, give sort of complex ideas some structure and then we're going to use words to explain the results and if you can do all three then hopefully you are able to uh, communicate uh, the idea behind the model okay so here we are actually solving for equilibrium in the goods market so what we want to do obviously is solve for y that means we need to move y uh, over to the left hand side and uh, get it by itself so the first thing we do is we distribute that C1. So we get C0 plus C1Y minus C1T plus I plus G. Um, and then we want to move this C1Y over to the left-hand side. That obviously becomes negative and we factor out this Y. So now we have 1 minus C1 times Y equals C0 plus I bar plus G minus C1T. And then just divide both sides by 1 minus C1 to get Y by itself. So we get Y over 1 minus C1 times C0 plus I bar plus G minus C1 times T. And, and that's our equilibrium, right? That if we put in values for investment, for government spending, for taxes, and for C0 and C1, we would be able to solve for Y. Now, in, you know, this model is so simplified that it's not going to be, you know, realistic uh, number for Y, but we can actually do that, right? We could actually solve for it. So let's think about our two pictures um, are two pieces of, uh, of the answer, right? So we've got uh, the thing in brackets, C0 plus I bar plus G minus C1T, and then we've got this thing outside the brackets, 1 over 1 minus C1. So the first piece we're going to call autonomous spending, right? That spending is uh, positive um, because uh, this minus C1T is going to be less than G, I is positive, C0 is positive, uh, so autonomous spending is positive. Uh, and then we have 1 over 1 minus C1, which is the multiplier. Now remember, we said C1 itself has to be less than 1. You can't spend more uh, than your disposable income. So 1 minus C1 is uh, less than 1, and 1 divided by 1 minus C1 then is, again, greater than 1. Um, so for example, if C1 equals 0 0.6, then the multiplier is 1 over 1 minus 0.6, or 1 divided by 0.4, which is 2.5. If C1 were equal to 0.5, uh, the multiplier would be 2. If C1 were equal to 0.9, the multiplier would be 10. That said, we want to treat this with a big grain of salt because uh, we've, we don't have a very sophisticated model yet of uh, the economy. So, when we say that an increase of consumption by a billion dollars will increase output by 2.5 times 1 billion, right? So if C0 increases by a billion or G increases by a billion, 
or investment spending increases by a billion, right? Any of those pieces in autonomous spending, then we get this multiplier effect that's greater than one. In this case, it would be equal to 2.5 billion. Now, we'll talk about what we sort of think reasonable estimates of the multiplier are. They are not 2.5. Um, the highest they get probably in a recession is about 1.5. Um, and in an expansion, when the economy doesn't have a lot of sort of extra resources laying around, uh, it's probably closer to one. Um, some people have even estimated that it's less than one. So now we want, we've solved for it algebraically. Now we want to solve for it uh, graphically, or we at least want to be able to graph the solution. And so what we're going to do is we're going to plot our demand function as a function of income, right? And so we can think of our autonomous spending and then our C1Y. That means that what demand is going up by some factor of income uh, that's less than one. It's going to look very similar to our consumption function, uh, but it's going to be shifted up because we've added in investment spending, government spending, etc. And then we have to remember that in equilibrium, production equals demand. So let's think about this. We've got demand and sort of production on the vertical axis. And we've got income, which also equals production on the horizontal axis. And all we're going to do for our equilibrium condition is draw this 45 degree line. This 45 degree line are all the points where income equals demand. So any of those points are potential equilibria. And we just need to find the one that is equal to our model by graphing the demand function. So the slope of the demand function, just like the slope of the consumption function, is equal to C1, which is less than 1. That's really important because, of course, the slope of the 45-degree line is equal to exactly 1, right? That's the definition. It's just y equals z. So we draw our uh, demand curve, right? This uh, vertical intercept is our autonomous spending. We draw our demand curve with a slope less than one. We know it will pass through at exactly one point because we've assumed that it is uh, a linear line. Um, and so that is A, right? That is our equilibrium. That is the equilibrium that we solve for um, when we solve for it algebraically. So then we can think about, all right, well, what happens when autonomous consumption increases or investment spending increases or government spending increases? Well, we start off here at A, and we increase automatically to B, right? And so that means that uh, we have higher demand, which means that in order to get to our new equilibrium, we need to increase production. Income goes up. That means production goes up. And then income goes up a little bit more, right? And so consumption goes up a little bit more. And so we move to point D and then point E, and we keep going in these little steps. So the idea here is, all right, we're spending a billion dollars more. Firms are like, oh, a billion dollars more. We gotta produce a billion dollars more worth of stuff. That means they hire more people. That means that income increases by a billion dollars, and people say, oh, I wanna increase my consumption by even more. By how much more? Well, if C1 is equal to 0.6, and income just went up by a billion dollars, then they're going to increase it by $600 million, right? So we've got the billion that it went up by originally, plus the $600 million. That means firms say, oh, we've got to increase production again. And so they increase production again. That increases income again. And people say, oh, I want to spend even more. Uh, but it's getting the amount is getting smaller and smaller because that uh, marginal propensity to consume, C1, is less than 1%. And so that's why each of these steps, going from A to B to C to D to E, all the way up to A prime, is getting smaller and smaller. And so it does eventually converge to A prime, uh, and we get our new equilibrium Y prime, which we know from the algebra is going to be 2.5 billion higher than our original uh, equilibrium. So this distance from A to B, that's our original billion dollars. Uh, but the distance from a from y to y prime is actually two and a half billion dollars. So this is just describing that, right? A to B is the first round increase in production. Then we have that first round increase in income. Then that we get the second round increase in demand, which is a bit smaller because C1 is less than one. That's CD. Then D to E is the second round increase in production, and it keeps going. 
and the total increase in production is just 1 plus c1 plus c1 squared plus c1 cubed plus c1 to the fourth, etc., etc. And this actually converges because c1 is less than zero. You can actually solve for it fairly e easily, but we'll let the mathematicians do that. Um, and then we get this limit of 1 over 1 minus c1, and that is exactly what our multiplier is from the solution uh, that we came up with algebraically. So let's make sure we can explain this uh, in words, right? So we say, all right, production depends on demand. Whatever people want to buy, firms are going to produce, right? That's our, our major assumption. That's our major sort of economic assumption in this model. Um, and the key point here is that we're not changing prices, right? We know from microeconomics that an increase in demand will lead to both an increase in output and an increase in price. We're not allowing that yet. Uh, we're going to allow that when we move to the medium run. Um, so production depends on demand. Demand depends on income. Um, and income, of course, is equal to production. GDP equals GDI. And so when we get an increase in income, that leads to an increase in production. Firms produce more. In order to produce more, they need to pay workers more. That leads to an increase in income, which then leads to a further increase in demand, but a smaller increase in demand because C1 is less than 1. That, that then leads to higher output um, overall, and eventually we get to the new equilibrium, um, and how much more depends on the multiplier, and the multiplier there depends on the marginal propensity to consume. Now, as we'll see, we get these really high multipliers in this early version of the model because it's a very simplified model. Uh, you don't have to pay extra taxes in this model if your income goes up. You don't spend any of your uh, more new consumption on uh, imports. And so those are, are both going to decrease our uh, model. And of course, prices can change. Um, and so that's going to decrease our uh, multiplier as well. So, you know, how much the multiplier is, how big the multiplier is, is a really hugely important question uh, in macroeconomics because it's going to determine the efficacy of fiscal policy, right? If we're in a recession, can the government just get us out of that recession by spending? Um, well, this model implies that they could, but we have to take that, you know, with some, with a grain of salt. We have to be careful in, in thinking about that. Um, although, you know, recent evidence from the financial crisis, um, not so much the pandemic because that's a little different situation, but uh, implies that government spending, especially during a recession, does have a multiplier greater than one. So the graph, I think, is very useful in thinking about the dynamics, right, of how that happens over time. Now, we're still in the short run here in Chapter 3. This is our first chapter, really, of the short run. Um, and so how long that takes is going to depend on, you know, how quickly people are buying more, how quickly firms can adjust production. And so this is one of the other questions about fiscal policy is, all right, well, it takes us time to realize we're in a recession. Then once we're in a recession, it takes time to pass, pass a fiscal policy program. Uh, and then by the time that it all happens, the economy may have recovered uh, already. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, as well.